So, um, shh, listen up, please. So I did the, I did the kind of online think aloud. Yesterday we talked about the format for the essay. You guys had the experience of writing it for those of you that that actually did it. So, in the, in the time that you were writing, that you found, you had a little bit of trouble with, Therese. Analyzing instead of summarizing. Okay. Analysis instead of summary. Okay. Yeah, Sherelle. Okay. Conclusion. Okay. Greg? Okay. Okay, making note of the purpose, audience, and tone. Why was why was that hard? Why? Okay, Mackenzie. Okay, so the balance between tone, purpose, audience. Did I miss anything? Versus the devices. Versus the devices. Okay, good. We're going to talk about that. Zach? Uh, you mean like better word choice? Like instead of repeating like the same, like beginning the sentence, like you said this or like whatever. And then like flowing into like that goes with, like flowing into quotes better. Gotcha. Okay. So word choice and then also introducing quotes. Okay, good. All right, so I want to address <clears throat> actually the one Mackenzie pointed out here, which is it, it's going to sound, I'm going to try to make it sound um, not overly abstract, but it, it just kind of is abstract. So when you look at a passage, you've got, the appeals, okay, which are ethos, pathos, and logos. And then you've got um, the devices, which a lot of people have said they're having a hard time <clears throat> acknowledging devices. And so I like to simplify it into, into these here. So syntax. Um, Diction, figurative language, and figurative language includes imagery, um, metaphor, personification, simile, symbolism, and to an extent, Illusion. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you also have tone. All right? Now, what happens when you're doing an analysis is it's, it's not like a plug and play where you can just say, he uses this type of syntax and this type of diction and this type of appeal in order to achieve this purpose. Sometimes what you have is an overlap where the imagery contributes to the tone, right? So if I describe um, an old haunted house with skeletons and spider webs and sort of a, a musty smell of death, okay? What is the tone that I'm kind of employing there? Dark, spooky, eerie, etc., right? So I'm using the imagery to create the tone. Now, the tone then might be sort of at, at the next step of that is that tone is an appeal to pathos. Because you guys mentioned being, <clears throat> maybe you got scared as you listened to me say that. You didn't really, but if that was the intent. Fear is an emotion, right? So then now we're talking about pathos, 
Okay? But if I say something like, um, now, mind you, the diction is part of what's making up the imagery. Because if I'm using words like dark, creepy, spider webs, death, skeletons, it's the diction that's contributing to the imagery. Make sense? Are you guys with me so far? Yeah. <clears throat> and then if I say, you know, something like, it was dark, it was scary, it was musty. Which of those things up there <clears throat> am I demonstrating? Syntax. Syntax. Parallel structure. Short sentence with basically the same structure. So now we're talking about syntax. But actually, not only is it syntax, because it also happens to be diction, because I chose to use those words, dark, scary, musty. Are you guys with me? So this, this is why writing this essay, it's not as simple as like, well, how do you write this essay? Well, you find the strategies and you write about the strategies and that's the end of it. Because depending on the topic, depending on the way it's written, student A might really key in on um, the appeals and, student, and talk a little bit about the devices. And student B might key, really key in on the devices and talk a little bit about the appeals, but they both talk about the tone. Those could both be very well-written papers, as long as you back up what you're saying. So the backing up is what's called like the leap of faith, where you say, where you answer this question, this affects the audience because or in this way. Because that's for you, that's an educated guess. You don't know how the audience is being affected. You don't know that somebody who reads this feels bad about Phil and his family. So you can't say necessarily with 100% certainty this is an appeal to emotion. You don't really know that. But what the readers are looking for is, does this student have the guts to make a case for what's happening here and how it's affecting the audience? Does that make sense? So it's not like math where you can just unlock, oh, here's the passage. I'm going to unlock exactly what they're saying and exactly what they're trying to do and then tell you and either I get it right or wrong. It's more like if you can find some, like you guys found some stuff in there that I didn't, that I didn't find. And I've taught this passage for several years. I hadn't thought about his work as a metaphor for his life. And all of the sample essays that I read never mentioned that. And they scored very well. So if you can keep in mind, when you approach it, you keep in mind that there's all of these things are interacting. Okay? And for those of you who are saying, well, I don't know how to find devices. I don't know how to find devices. There's 104 of them. Focus just on those. I promise every single passage that you see, there's going to be at least a couple of those that you can analyze. And keep in mind that tone is determined by syntax and diction. Right? The way your words are arranged and the words that you use. So, for example, and this goes back to the, to the very beginning of the class, if I say... Um, Arkel stop being a jerk exclamation point okay the difference between Arkel stop being a jerk exclamation point and You see the difference? So 
Word choice. I chose to use the word Arkel because when you use somebody's name, it's just more powerful. Arkel. When you hear it, it's like, Luke, he's calling me out. Stop being a jerk. That's kind of a, a loaded word, right? And then in terms of syntax, that even has, a, I think that even has a different meaning than stop being a jerk, Arkel. Arkel, stop being a jerk. So just the position of the word Arkel affects the message. And then by using an exclamation point, which is really syntax, um, the tone totally changes. My tone here is kind of demanding, almost, you know, condescending. Whereas my tone here is kind of respectful. So instead of saying, you're a jerk, I'm just saying, would you refrain from the behavior? So I'm actually separating the person from the behavior, whereas here I'm kind of basically saying you're a jerk. So syntax and diction then contribute to tone. That's the sort of foundation of a rhetorical analysis, and then everything else is kind of an outcropping of that. Okay, And then remember, you do not have to name the device or appeal. So let's say I was watching basketball for the first time, and I didn't know that um, I didn't know the term slam dunk. I, I just didn't know the term. But I said, you know, the player elevated through the ball through the hoop and hung on to the rim as he finished. I'm still describing what happened. I'm still kind of analyzing what happened you can do the exact same thing. So instead of saying, and if you're kind of racking your brain like, I know that's an illusion, but what's the word, what's the word? If you just say, he references another work from, you know, history, that's sufficient. Okay. You guys with your heads down, are you guys all getting this? Yes. Okay. Um... So we kind of, um, so to jump from analysis to summary, I'm sorry, to jump from summary to analysis, basically it's answering that question. So you intro your evidence, you give the evidence, and then you explain how the evidence contributes to the author's argument. Okay. So that is, you can't possibly be summarizing if you do this. Because if you didn't know anything about analyzing argument, you couldn't do that part. You would just read the passage and say, well, this is what the passage says. But you wouldn't actually know, you wouldn't be able to analyze it. Remember, to analyze is to explain how something works. Um, okay, I'm going to do something on introducing quotes next week because I'll hold, I'm going to hold on to that. But the conclusion, I purposely didn't have not gone over conclusions yet, but I'm going to give you a real quick and easy conclusion lesson. How many of you guys take science, a science class right now? So what's the, what is, who can tell me the scientific method? Jillian. C-E-R. E R, what does C stand for? Uh, claim, claim, like your thesis statement. It's your thesis, okay. Yeah. Uh, e is evidence. Okay. Okay. And then R is reasoning. Okay. So when I was in school, you came up with the hypothesis. Oh, you're talking about the scientific method. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's how they do. Oh, yeah. what's the scientific method? Sorry. 
Is it basically hypothesis, experiment, conclusion? Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Okay. So, in science, this is really important. In science, can you draw a conclusion before you've done the experiment? No. Okay. So this is what's wrong in English class, and this is what's wrong with the way we teach writing. And part of it is that you have to be near or at a college level to actually write a real conclusion. A real conclusion is a conclusion. It's not the last paragraph of your essay that restates exactly what you said at the beginning. That's a last paragraph. So a conclusion is, now that blank, this must be true. That's essentially what a conclusion is. So your paper, your body paragraphs, are your experiment, in a sense. And so it's the difference between, how, how can I say this? It's the difference between presenting an argument and developing an argument. So if you, if you present an argument, you already know what your conclusion is. If you, develop your, if you develop an argument, you arrive at a conclusion at the end. Does that make sense? You arrive at a conclusion at the end. And so when you get really good at this, you will actually be writing your essay. And most of you guys aren't here yet. You'll be writing your essay, and you don't even know totally what your conclusion is yet. And then you get to the conclusion, and it's like, oh, obviously, this is the conclusion. Okay? So you can't really outline a conclusion, but it's, it's basically something like, you know, ultimately, then, um, Goodman's... Um, indictment of corporate America is both um, accurate and only then good in the time in the book in America is both accurate and um, alarming. Her satirical profile of Phil is actually an attack on society as a whole. Okay, now that was off the top of my head. Now you could read that and go, well, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. Well, that's fine. You don't have to agree with it. That's the point. You have to make a leap, kind of a leap of faith in what you're saying. Um, so that would connect back to my thesis because let's say my thesis really focused on her use of satire. So you can't actually write a conclusion until you've written all of the rest of the paper. But it's two sentences, three sentences max in a conclusion, <clears throat> especially when you're doing a timed essay. Um, any questions about the rhetorical analysis? Is this making some sense? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, my, I try to limit myself to 20 minutes of being up here talking. I'm at about 19.22 right now. So. What's that? The devices make more sense. Okay. Just to, to what's that? Well, Therese, can you tell me what happened, tell them what happened during advisory? So the confidence piece, you're probably you're doing better than you think you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. 
So practice, if you want to, if you want to practice um, every single AP prompt, uh, 